Hello everyone. This is Dr. Yamina Kayim. Today here to discuss electrochemistry. Fundamental aspects, theoretical and practical considerations of electrochemical and electrolytic reactions will be discussed as well as some of the applications. I hope graduate level chemistry students to benefit this. With that, let's now move on to it. So, let's start with electrochemistry. The entire lecture is given in two sessions. The first session deals with the fundamentals and electrolytic processes and in the second session we will exclusively discuss the electrochemical reactions. So, welcome to the first part of electrochemistry lectures, the fundamentals. To start with, let's see what is electrochemistry. It studies the relation between chemical and electrical changes that is interconversion between chemical energy and electrical energy is dealt under electrochemistry. The conversion of chemical energy to electrical energy occurs in electrochemical reactions and the conversion from electrical energy to chemical energy occurs in electrolysis. In an electrochemical reaction, in its heart consists of an electrode and an electrolyte as shown here in the most simplified picture. Electricity is conducted from one electrode to the other electrode through the electrolyte by the movement of particles called ions. We will see the detailed procedure very soon. Before that, we will see some of the applications of electrochemistry or why we need to learn electrochemistry. In our modern life, we come across ideas or products of electrochemistry in every walk of our life. For example, it can be environmental pollution controlling and monitoring, synthesis of organic or inorganic chemicals, medicinal applications starting from the glucometer to the highly advanced dialytic apertures, Various separation techniques, for example, in metallurgy, various sensors and a wide variety of energy sources starting from the simplest battery to highly advanced fuel cells and others. Now, we will see some of the earliest milestones in electrochemistry. It started already in 1793 when Alessandro Volta observed that electricity is produced when two dissimilar metals are placed on a moist paper. Very soon, two people, Nicholson and Carlesley, came up with electrolysis. They observed that water can be decomposed by passing electricity through it. And Farad, sorry, Humphrey Davy in 1806 provided an explanation relating electricity and chemistry. He said there is a link or there is a chemical reason behind the decomposition of water or production of electricity through electrolyte. And Berzelius soon found out that there are moving conducting particles within the electrolytes which are responsible for the conduction of electricity. And then Michael Faraday came up with the very famous laws of electrochemistry and a number of people contributed to the growth and development of electrochemistry in later years but just I wanted to point out some of the earliest milestones here. Now with that background we will move on to the very important terms that we need in our further discussions. The first one is electrolyte. Electrolyte is the conducting solution. It conducts electricity in molten state or in aqueous solution by the movement of particles called ions. Electrolytes are of two types. The first type is strong electrolytes. They undergo complete ionization when in molten state or when, in, when put in water. For example, potassium chloride, sodium hydroxide, etc. And then there are weak electrolytes. They undergo only partial ionization. The molecule dissociates to form ions but only partially, only a part of the molecules undergo ionization at reasonable concentrations. Acetic acid, ammonium hydroxide are the examples for weak electrolytes. And then we have electrodes in an electrochemical system. They conduct electricity into electrolyte. Mostly they are inert metal rods. And what urges the ions to move? It is the potential difference between the electrodes that urges the ions to move through the electrolyte and this potential difference is called EMF, the electromotive force. And then there is conductance, the ability of electrolyte to conduct electricity, to allow the passage of electricity that is called conductance represented by G. 
and conductivity or specific conductance is a standardized form of conductance defined by the conductance measured in an electrolyte when the electrolyte is kept between electrodes of 1 cm square area of cross section and when they are kept at 1 cm apart. As shown here in this cell, the electrodes are of a, the area of cross section A and the distance between them is L. If the area of cross section A is 1 cm square and the distance L is 1 cm, the conductance measured for this electrolyte will be the specific conductance or conductivity. And this particular ratio that is L to A, the distance between the ele electrodes to the area of cross section of the electrode give you the cell constant that is the property of the given cell. And cell constant relates the conductance and conductivity like this through those equations. And then we have molar conductance, an important term in which conductance is expressed and this expresses the conductance in relation to the concentration of the electrolyte in terms of molarity. Lambda m is the representation, lambda m is related to the conductance through molarity of the solution and then we have equivalent conductance, the most used way of or the expression of conductance in terms of normality of the given electrolyte. It is the lamb, it is represented by capital lambda. And now we will see how the conductance varies or what are the different factors determining the conductance of a given electrolyte. Obviously, we have temperature. We know when temperature increases, the movement or mobility of particles inside the electrolyte may be affected and this may reflect in conductance. Normally, we expect an increase in conductance with increase in temperature because mobility of ions increase with increase in temperature. This may cause an increase in conductance. And then we have another factor whether the electrolyte, the nature of the electrolyte, whether it is strong or weak. We have seen that strong electrolytes dissociate completely, but the weak electrolytes do not dissociate completely. Therefore, the amount of ions furnished in strong electrolyte and weak electrolyte differ. This may cause a difference in conductances of strong and weak electrolyte. Then, obviously, the size and mobility of ions. It is the ions who carry electricity through the electrolyte. Though for the nature of the ions, especially the size and mobility of the ion determines the conductance. And hydration status, we know that when put in a solvent, the ions undergo solvation. If it is in water, it is called hydration. The hydration status, hydration of ion causes the size to become large and a larger hydration result in a larger hydration shell or larger ion. This may affect its mobility and this may reflect later in the conductance measurement. Obviously, the solvent characteristics, solvent dipole moment, solvent viscosity, etc. may affect the conductance by affecting the mobility of the ions. The solvent properties, solvent may interact with the ions and may hinder or enhance the movement of ions or mobility of the ions. This may hinder the, sorry, this may affect the conductance and concentration of the electrolyte. When we add up more and more solvent, it becomes diluted. And what happens or how the concentration of the electrolyte determines the conductance. This is seen in, this will be seen in details here. In the first beaker, you will see an electrolyte at a particular concentration and coming to the second beaker, we have diluted it. So, more, it occupies more volume but the same amount. So, we have got a diluted electrolyte. What happens to equivalent conductance when we do a dilution or when the concentration is lower, equivalent conductance increases with decrease in concentration or in other terms, equivalent conductance increases with dilution and it reaches a maximum at a stage called infinite dilution or near zero concentration. And the infinite dilution state is a state where even the weak electrolytes undergo complete ionization. We have seen that weak electrolytes are only partially ionized but at this dilution, at this infinite extent of dilution, even the weak electrolytes are expected to undergo complete ionization. And 
at infinite dilution the equivalent conductance measured will be the highest value of the equivalent conductance or the maximum value of equivalent conductance this is called the limiting equivalent conductivity represented by lambda zero as shown here and this gives an important result called conductance ratio the ratio between the equivalent conductance measured at a given concentrations lambda given concentration lambda c to the conductance at infinite dilution or zero concentration that is lambda at a given concentration to lambda at zero concentration this gives the conductance ratio and we will see later that the conductance ratio alpha corresponds to the degree of dissociation in case of weak electrolyte we will see the details of weak electrolyte and degree of dissociation soon and lambda zero that is the equivalent conductance at infinite dilution cannot be measured but can be calculated and for that calculation we use the help of something called debye huckel onsager equation you will see how it works we have got a plot of equivalent conductance against the square root of concentration at different concentrations we measure the equivalent conductance and this plot is made and we will see for strong electrolytes we observe this tendency that as we move from higher concentration to lower concentrations sorry higher concentration to lower concentration along this direction the equivalent conductance increases but with a negative slope and if we extrapolate this to a zero concentration that is the case of infinite dilution the y intercept will give you the lambda zero that is equivalent conductance at infinite dilution or the limiting equivalent conductance for strong electrolyte and this relation between lambda and square root of concentration is expressed by debye huckel onsager equation as shown here and it is related through a constant a which is the characteristics of solvent and temperature so it is obvious that for strong electrolytes solvents take part the, there is an important role for the solvents and this tendency that is uh, lowering in sorry increase in equivalent conductance with lowering in concentration or increase in dilution can be explained as due to with change in concentration or at high concentration if you increase the concentration at high concentration the ions are kept closer to each other that is the distance interionic distances become lower and lower and hence the interionic interactions become larger and larger at higher and higher concentrations then the mobility of the ions are affected because they are attracting each other so this reflects in the conductivity because the mobility of ions are affected and hence the conductivity is also affected that's why at high and high concentrations we get lower conductances as in here but this is the case of only strong electrolyte what is the case of weak electrolyte the observation for weak electrolyte is as follows as the concentration decreases like this we can see for weak electrolytes the equivalent conductance increases only very slowly and at a concentration close to zero it increases very dramatically like this so what could be the reason why weak electrolytes behave entirely different from strong electrolyte and how can we calculate the lambda zero value for weak electrolyte so it is obvious that the lambda zero value of weak electrolyte cannot be obtained from this graph as we got it for the strong electrolyte so why weak electrolytes behave differently how the lambda zero can be measured that's what we will see in the next slides so explanation on the characteristics of weak electrolytes was given by William Oswald in 1888 and in the form of Oswald dilution law the law states weak electrolyte undergoes complete ionization at infinite dilution only we have seen that weak weak electrolytes are only partially ionized and complete ionization occurs only at infinite dilution that's what he says so there exists a factor called degree of dissociation alpha that is at a given concentration at a reasonable concentration what is the amount of molecules that undergo ionization we know that at reasonable concentration not all molecules ionize 
Therefore, the fraction of molecules which undergo ionization at a given concentration that is given by alpha. And alpha is relate alpha relates the conductance and sorry not the conductance alpha relates the equilibrium constant or the ionization constant and the concentration. For example, let's see here is acetic acid a weak electrolyte anises to give you acetate ion and proton and the ions and unionized acetate occur sorry unionized acetic acid are in equilibrium with each other and this equilibrium constant is the ionization constant we will see this very soon the ionization constant definition so this ionization constant k and the concentration of the electrolyte are related through the degree of dissociation alpha here and now what happens or how the weak electrolyte equivalent conductance increases only very gradually with dilution in the beginning and then gives a drastic increase at the infinite dilution because at normal concentrations the ionization is very poor contributing to very small change in conductance but near to infinite dilution or near to zero concentration according to Oswald dilution all the molecules undergo ionization furnishes a large number of ions at infinite dilution this may con contribute to an increase in conductance this is how Oswald dilution law explains the tendency or variation of equivalent conductance with concentration in case of weak electrolyte but the point is that the law fails to explain the behavior of strong electrolytes because the behavior of strong electrolyte with dilution was explained based on the interionic interactions but Oswald dilution law is silent about such interactions that's why it was not able to explain the strong electrolyte trend and it is worth remembering that the law is not very exact even for weak electrolytes according to thermodynamical considerations because in thermochemistry we deal with equilibrium in terms of not only concentrations we use a term called activity which is related to concentrations through activity coefficients so to reach the exact solution on weak electrolyte we need to incorporate the concept of activity which, which uh, Oswald did not do inside still although it the, there is some failure in that respect Oswald dilution law explains the behavior of weak electrolyte very well and a number of observations also can be explained based on this law so it is still valid now we will see how the equivalent conductance at infinite dilution for a weak electrolyte is measured for that we use the help of Kohl-Rausch law of independent migration Kohl-Rausch proposed this law in 1875 and it says that at infinite dilution the dissociation of a weak electrolyte is complete and hence each ion makes a definite contribution to the equivalent conductivity of the whole electrolyte irrespective of the nature of the other associated ion again at infinite dilution we have seen the electrolyte undergo complete dissociation and hence each ion make a definite contribution to the total conductance of the electrolyte without bothering what is the nature of the other associated counterpart so from that we get an important result that equivalent conductance at infinite dilution of an electrolyte can be represented as a sum of equivalent conductances of the respective ions here the small letter lambdas are used to represent the ionic equivalent conductances at infinite dilution so this is a mathematical expression of kohl rausch law and now we will see how the law is applied to calculate the equivalent conductance at infinite dilution for weak electrolyte let's go through it with an example of acetic acid suppose we want to calculate the lambda zero value for acetic acid we need to consider three strong electrolytes before that acetic acid kohl rausch equation can be written like this that is lambda zero of acetic acid is the sum of lambda zeros of proton and acetate ion to reach this right hand side of this equation 
we consider three strong electrolytes here sodium acetate hydrogen chloride and sodium chloride for each of these strong electrolytes we write the kohlrautz equation for sodium acetate the equivalent conductance at infinite dilution lambda 0 is the sum of sodium lambda 0 to and acetate lambda 0 for hydrogen chloride it is sum of hydrogen lambda 0 and chloride lambda 0 for sodium chloride it is sum of sodium lambda 0 and chloride lambda 0 now we simply do a mathematical procedure here the first two equations here are added up and the third equation is subtracted what happens to the left hand side the first two equivalent conductances that is sodium acetate and hcl are added up and sodium chloride is subtracted and on the right hand side we get lambda 0 hydrogen plus lambda 0 acetate this is exactly what we wanted to have to find out the equivalent conductance of acetic acid at infinite dilution so if we get or if we obtain the equivalent conductances at infinite dilution for those three strong electrolytes we can reach to the equivalent conductance at infinite dilution for this weak electrolyte and for those three strong electrolyte we can obtain the values through the respective graphs from experimental measurements so this is how Kohlrautz law is applied to find out the lambda zero values for weak electrolytes. Now we will see. We will just go through some other applications of Kohlrautz law. It helps to calculate degree of dissociation alpha because alpha is the conductance ratio, conductance at a given concentration to conductance at zero concentration. Lambda zero is given through the lambda zeros of respective ions, and it helps to find out the ionic product of water solubility product of sparingly soluble salts like silver chloride or lead sulfate etc and that's about kohlrautz law the theory of oswald dilution on weak electrolytes and how to calculate how how the kohlrautz law help to calculate the lambda zero for weak electrolyte now we will see arrhenius theory Actually, Savanti Arrhenius already in 1884, before Oswald's dilution law came up with his ideas on electrolytic dissociation. Here in this lecture, I just mixed up the chronological orders. I just wanted to follow a more of followable logical order. That's why I just mixed the chronological order and put the Oswald dilution law before the Arrhenius theory. So let's go to Arrhenius theory. According to Arrhenius, he says. electrolytes they when they when they are put in solution they breaks into charged particles called ions and positive ions are called cations and negative ions are anions and an example is shown here sodium chloride at arrhenius time it was the view that a sodium chloride crystals when put in water they undergo ionization or breakage to form sodium and chloride ion and now with the advancement of uh, modern techniques we know that already in solid sodium chloride excess sodium and chloride ions and when they are put in water they undergo dissociation or they just makes the ions free and arrhenius told this process of breakage of the molecules to obtain ions is called ionization and the ions present the formed ions they re reunite to form the unionized molecule or the neutral molecule uh, like this the nacl sodium and chloride comes back forward to form the neutral nacl and there exists an equilibrium between the unionized molecule and the ions and the equilibrium is characterized by a constant the equilibrium constant gives the ionization constant which is the ratios of the ionic concentrations to the unionized molecule concentration and arrhenius says charged ions move to oppositely charged electrodes during electrolysis that is how electrolytes conduct electricity by the movement of ions and electrolytic conductivity depends on the number of ions present that's what arrhenius said and all those postulates can be expressed in terms of this simple picture we have got an electrolyte when dissolved in solvent this electrolyte gives out ions they undergo ionization here sodium and chloride ions 
when electrodes are dipped in and electricity is provided this ions move to oppositely charged electrodes like sodium moves to negative electrode and chloride ions move to positive electrode and this movement of ions gives out the conductivity and the conductivity depends on the number of ions present this is all what arrhenius talked about electrolysis or electrolytes and now we see some of the evidences which came up afterwards which came up after arrhenius proposed this theory with the advancement of x ray diffraction techniques we have seen that crystal structure of a solid like sodium chloride already consists of sodium and chloride ions so it is no wonder that when they are dissolved in water they releases this sodium and chloride ions and arrhenius concepts of ionization is proved and we know ionic reactions for example when chloride ion is put in silver nitrate solution we get a white precipitate of silver chloride such ionic reactions exist in the world that means ions do exist and color of a number of solutions of to the color given by the respective ions like in copper sulfate and we know there are neutralization reactions acids are getting neutralized by the addition of equivalent amount of bases this is an ionic reaction between hydroxyl and hydrogen ions and we observe abnormal colligative properties we know that colligative properties are determined by the number of solute particles inside and we observe abnormal colligative properties in case of polar solute because it contributes to when ionization happens it contributes largely to the number of solute particles and so we have measured colligative properties deviating from the expected one we will see the details of colligative properties in one of the upcoming lectures in future and an important relation ohm's law we know that metallic conductors obey ohm's law and also electrolytic conductors obey ohm's law that is the current produced i is directly proportional to the voltage and inversely proportional to the resistance offered by the electrolyte so this direct relation between current and voltage if ions were not already present and energy had to be given to produce ions this direct relation would not hold the iv relation would not hold the current is directly proportional to voltage because the ions are already present no extra energy to be provided to cause ionization so these are some of the selected evidences which confirms the idea of ions and ionization proposed by arrhenius there are some limitations of arrhenius theory observed also because if we remember arrhenius said strong electrolytes undergo or electrolytes undergo dissociation or ionization when put in a solvent and now we know that with advancement of chemistry we know that strong electrolytes undergo ionization already in a in the absence of a solvent just in the molten state for example sodium chloride without needing a solvent in the molten state or in the fused state it conducts electricity it undergoes ionization and conducts electricity like this and secondly arrhenius does not account for the factors influencing the mobility of ions he just said ions are moving but he didn't say what are the factors affecting the mobility of this ions and we have already seen oswald dilution law and it is based on arrhenius concept of ionization and this law is not applicable to strong electrolytes that's why this can be treated as a limitation of arrhenius theory so with that now we, we can move on to the speed of ions the point which arrhenius kept silent about how the mobility of ions contribute to conductance and this observation is that a mobility of ions causes a loss of concentration at electrode or loss of concentration occurring during electrolysis corresponds to the mobility of ions we will see it in a detailed demonstration soon and this idea was given by hitov's rule hitov's rule says loss of concentration at any electrode is proportional to the speed of ion moving away from it electrode during electrolysis at each electrode 
experiences a concentration fall and this concentration fall is according to the speed of move ion moving away from it we will see it through this demonstration i've got a big electrolytic chamber here it is divided into th three compartments the anode compartment sorry anode compartment cathode compartment in between a middle compartment i've got sodium chloride inside that is sodium and chloride ions are present in equal amounts because both are univalent ions suppose my chloride ions are faster than sodium ions or just imagine that chloride ions are moving not sodium ions what happens this is the case so see when chloride ions negative ions move to the positive electrode there occurred a fall in concentration at the negative electrode and in another scenario let's imagine only sodium ions are moving not chloride ions what happens is this now we see a fall in concentration at the positive electrode and in the third case let's imagine both the sodium and chloride ions move with the same mobility they move to the same extent what happens concentration fall occurs at both the electrode in equal amounts this is what we observe so obviously there occurs concentration fall at the electrodes and concentration fall at cathode that is a negative electrode depends on the mobility of the negative ion and concentration fall at anode depends on the mobility of the positive ion and if both the ions are having same mobility the concentration falls at both the electrodes are same so this is what hitov said and he related the fall in concentration to speed of cation the ratios of fall in concentration can be written as the ratios of cationic velocities u plus gives the velocity or mobility of the positive ion or cation and u minus is the mobility of anion and hitov proposed this idea that's why it's called hitov's rule and now the question is how is this ionic mobility directly reflecting the electrolytic conductance we have seen the ionic mobility reflects in fall in concentration now how it is reflected in electrolytic conductance and this is given in terms of transport number or it's also called transference number transport number represents the contribution of each ion to the total conductance such that the fraction of electric current carried by a given ion in the total electrolytic current is called the transport number or transference number for example for cations we can write it like this the ratio of the current carried by the cation i plus to the total current carried in the electrolyte that is the transport number of cation and for anion it is the ratio of current carried by the anion to the total current that is the anionic transport number so if you just do this summation t plus plus t minus will be unity and this transport number by using hitov's rule can also be written in terms of ionic mobilities this is the mobility of the cation and here is the total mobility of both cations and anions likewise transport number of anion can be written as ratio of mobility of anion to the total ionic mobility and the ratio of transport numbers will be the ratio of ionic mobilities this is the basis of the basic idea behind trans transport number or transference number how each ionic mobility contribute to fall in concentration that is given by hitov and how each ion contribute to electrolytic conductance that is given by in terms of transport number now there are two different methods to find out transport number of ions the first one is hitov's method in this we have got a chamber like this with anionic com anodic compartment and cathodic compartment separated by a middle compartment here in this example we have got silver nitrate solution inside and there is a setup for electrolysis and here is a setup that called silver voltmeter to measure the silver deposition occurring during electrolysis what we do is we conduct electrolysis and before and after we know that during electrolysis the rocus of fall in concentration the rocus of fall in concentration of silver at anode and before and after we we measure the amount of silver 
at the anodic compartment by some other analytical techniques like volumetric titration. And this difference in concentration of silver at the anodic compartment will give the fallen concentration at anode and respectively at cathode also you get the fallen concentration and the ratio will give you the mobility ratios and from that you can find out the transport numbers. Once you find the transport number of positive ion, obviously you get the transport number of the negative ion because the sum of transport numbers will be unity. We have seen this. That is how we see the Hitos apparatus for measuring transport number. And the next method is moving boundary method. We have a clear boundary and this boundary moves during electrolysis. Here we have got a vertical column. The lower part is filled with calcium cadmium chloride solution and the upper part with hydrogen chloride solution. There is an important significance of this selection because the hydrogen chloride and cadmium chloride, the layer of separation can be seen clearly because they, these two solutions differ in refractive indices significantly. And suppose this is the initial boundary before electrolysis. And during electrolysis, the boundary reaches here because during electrolysis, you have got evolution of hydrogen from the upper part and chloride ion moves to here in the lower part. The volume of the lower part increases and the final boundary reaches here. And you can see in a given time to what extent or to what distance the boundary get displaced. From this, you can directly measure the movement or the displacement of the boundary layer in a given time. That is how you can convert this to transport number. So, that is how you measure transport number by Hitox method and by moving boundary method. With that, let us now move on to conductivity measurement and their application. The last part of this session. Conductivity is measured in modern times by using a digital conductivity meter. The meter provides, this is a calibrated instrument and it provides, just got an electrode. The electrode is dipped in the electrolyte which is our analyte and for the for a calibrated device you can read the conductivity here at the display. This is how it works and it has got a number of applications. Mainly it is used to find out the dissociation constant alpha of weak electrolyte like this and solubility product of sparingly soluble salt like this and ionic product of water and the point of our concern, the most important point of our concern is conductometric titrations. We know, we do normally volumetric titrations to find out the amount or concentration of an ally. Here the same can be done by using conductometric titrations but with better accuracy and sensitivity. This is a setup for conductometry titration. You have got a conductometer here, electrode dipped in the electrolyte, which is our analyte, and titrant is added from the burette. And the idea is with every addition from the burette or during titration, the ion from the analyte is replaced by the ion from the titrant. So there is a replacement of ion, change in ion, change in the nature of ion, the ionic mobility changes. This will reflect in conductivity. Conductivity will change. This conductivity reflects the or it gives out the equivalence point of the titration. We will see it through some examples. Before that, the conductometric titrations are highly helpful in special cases like for dilute solutions. For very dilute solutions, we cannot do volumetric titrations because volume measurements are not that accurate or sensitive. And for weak acids, for weak electrolytes, we cannot do the volumetric titrations, but conductometric titrations are very effective there or efficient there. And for colored turbid solutions, we have good problem with volumetric titrations because during volumetry, we normally depend on the color changes and colored and turbid solutions can mislead our eyes. And at this cases, conductometric titrations can be adopted. And of course, for precipitation titration also. These are some of the cases where conductometry titrations give excellent results exclusively. With that, let us see some of the examples of strong acid against weak base, sorry, strong acid against strong base titration like in HCl, NaOH titration. This is how the pattern look like. Let us see. In the beginning, we know in our vessel, the analyte is HCl. It is there and from burette, we are adding sodium hydroxide. So, in the Beaker, we have got HCl dissociating into hydrogen and chloride ion. 
During titration, when we add sodium hydroxide, it reacts with HCl to get sodium ion, chloride ion, and here the OH and H plus react to give water. Water is a weak electrolyte, it dissociates only very slowly. Therefore, it does not contribute to conductance, but sodium and chloride ions contribute to conductance. But what happens? In the beginning, we had protons and sorry, hydrogens and chloride ions. Here, the hydrogens are now replaced by sodium ions. Hydrogens are very small, high, highly mobile ion, but sodium is larger and less mobile. So, the less mob lower mobility of sodium causes lower conductance. So, as we add more and more sodium hydroxide during titration, we get lower and lower conductances. But what happens at the end point or at the equivalence point? All the hydrogen chlorides are consumed, only sodium hydroxide remains and sodium and hydroxyl ions are there. This contribute to the conductance, especially hydroxyl, these are strongly ionizing sodium hydroxide and the hydroxyl ion contributes to conductance very largely. So, the, hydro the conductance of the system increases drastically and this inflection point between the two lines will give you the equivalence point of the titration. This is the case of strong acid, weak base, strong acid, strong base titration. Now, we will see the next example of strong acid, weak base titration, HCl against ammonium hydroxide. Again, in the beginning, we have got HCl in the vessel furnishing these two ions, they contribute to good conductance and when ammonium hydroxide is added, we have got now ammonium ion, chloride ion and water and see hydrogens are replaced by ammonium ion, ammonium ions are less mobile contributing to conductance only a, to a lower extent than hydrogens. So, the conductance decreases as you add more and more ammonia solution and now at the end point, what happens is all the hydrogen chloride is consumed and the excess ammonium hydroxide only remains and ammonium hydroxide being a weak electrolyte, it undergoes only poor dissociation, does not contribute to conductance. That's why the conductance does not change at all. So, this kind of inflection occurs and the inflection point here will give you the equivalence point. Coming to the third example of weak acid against weak base titration like an acetic acid against ammonium hydroxide. We know acetic acid is a weak, very weak acid. It dissociates only very weakly. So, it does not contribute significantly to conductance. You see the, in the initial conductance is very small the value. But when you add ammonium hydroxide, acetic acid reacts with ammonium hydroxide to give you ammonium acetate. And this ammonium acetate even suppresses because there, ex, there is a common ion effect. Ammonium acetate provides acetate ion. Already acetic acid produces acetate ion. So, the common ion effect causes the already weak ionization of acetic acid to be suppressed further. Therefore, the conductance is even lowered. And when you add more and more ammonium hydroxide, the amount of ammonium acetate become larger and larger. The common ion effect disappears and the ammonium acetate effect starts to dominate. It dissociates and gives contributes to conductance significantly. At the end point, all the acetic acid are con consumed and only ammonium hydroxide remains. But ammonium hydroxide is a weak base and contributes to sorry it dissociates only poorly and does not contribute to conductance so the conductance remains almost constant and this inflection point here will give you the end point or equivalence point of the titration so this is about conductometric titrations very important like it helps in measurement of analytes or quantitative analysis of analytes with very high accuracy and very high sensitivity and with that let us wind up the first part of our electrochemistry lectures and in the next session we will see each other with electrochemical reactions very soon I will come up with that. Before that if you have questions and would like to give feedback please contact me on this email and I would like to suggest some references mainly the, this two physical electrochemistry fundamentals techniques and applications and the second one is fundamentals of electrochemistry. And I would like to thank those web pages from which I have taken so many figures or images. And obviously, I thank you. And soon we will meet each other with the electrochemistry lectures, the second part that is electrochemical reactions. And thank you.